Hi, everybody. Hi. So um, let's sing together. I see trees of green, red roses too. I see them bloom for me and for you. And I think to myself, So Louis Armstrong, he was like nearly right. He was nearly right, like 90% right, right? Because it is a wonderful world. It's an astonishing world. And it's a very difficult world. How many of you have had a dark, difficult thought about the state of your country recently? How many of you, like me, ever worked for the prince or princess of darkness? Has anyone looked in a mirror and thought to yourself, oh God, this is what I have to deal with now? <laughs> Death, illness, disease, betrayal, loss, corruption, an annoying neighbor who refuses to put his garbage cans back. All of these are what we must live with these days. This morning's conversation is about constructing resilience, and we begin here with the notion of choice. What we choose to emphasize in this complex history will determine our lives. The future is made up of a series of moments of being present to the moments we have, an infinite succession of presence. So I want to run through fairly quickly six of the research-based primary resilience building perspectives and tools that we have that enabled us to navigate the difficulties of our world and return over and over again to its wondrousness. The first, of course, is our capacity to choose to focus on the good, on states of positivity, to prioritize, as Barbara Fredrickson and her team have suggested, those things that elevate the good in our days. When we focus on states of positivity, not only does it create that beautiful broaden and build that you all have heard about, it does two things in the presence of suffering. Number one, it creates respite. For a moment, the mind and the heart are at peace. We are removed from anxiety about the future of our suffering, what may or may not happen. We are quieted from worry about the agoni agonies of the past and how they will continue to scar us. We are in these states, captivated and present to the wonder that is available to us at any moment. So there is respite. And the second meta-benefit that accrues is hope. Not hope that everything will work out beautifully because it won't, but hope that we will find a way through that we will find a way to navigate these ups and downs such that we can return again and again to our potentially better selves. Second, we must invest in our character strengths, the strengths that, are, that represent those qualities and values that are already within us, that come to us naturally, the strengths that lead us to the research benefits, thank God for the VIA people and the Mayerson people and the Gallup people for helping us articulate, as Neil Mayerson says, the treasure trove of wonder within us. And we invest in our strengths through, uh, we like to do 30-day practices. I've invested 30 days of bravery, 30 days of elevating self-esteem, 30 days of zest, 30 days of boldness. Recently, my, my new investment in strengths is 30 days of gratitude toward inanimate objects. Why not play with life, right? Why not have fun? Gratitude is one of my top five strengths. It's very easy for me. And because it's somewhat easy for me, I happen to get a little bored with it. it like the writing the thing down, the letter, like enough already. Like I'm wicked old, I've done it, right? But so how do I, how do I invest in this incredibly resilience building tool in such a way that it actually elevates me? So I herniated a disc in my back nine months ago. This is Jean-Paul. I had Alejandro first, but I lost him in London. <laughs> I try not to talk about him too much in front of Jean-Paul. My uh, treadmill, I'm very grateful for my treadmill. I'm up to 17, 18 minutes of walking on my treadmill. I call her Medusa. 
because she destroys me, and yet if we remember our history, Medusa, the blood of Medusa is also healing. As I invest in my capacity to be grateful for those things that support me in returning to full health, I remember that the blood I am sweating and moving forward will also be healing, not just for myself, but for others. Poet laureate Stanley Kunitz said it this way, Father, bless my good right arm, I have only three throws. In the haze of the afternoon, as the air flows saffron, I play my game for keeps. Investing in our strengths enables us to play our game, our lives for keeps. It engenders clarity. I have a plan of how I'm going to show up. It engenders optimism. I believe I can move forward by, in, by elevating my strengths. It engenders dignity also, because we know we are moving from the place that is our better self. Third, we want to activate true hope, not false hope, not delusional hope, but hope that first encourages us to face reality as it is. Life is difficult. It is challenging. I am in pain. We are worried about our loved ones. We're not sure what's going to happen in our countries. We have to face reality as it is and build in a beautiful and. These are three women, good friends, who turned 50 together in the same year, and they each got a tattoo of an ampersand, reminding themselves that they were who they were and... The next 50 years, they might be a little different, a little more joyful, a little more playful, a little wiser, a little more in love with their lives. We must face reality as it is and move to create a slightly better future each day, every day, as if the day mattered. Third, we must construct meaning. This is the gorgeous Sydney Opera House. Notice the heart constructed in the middle, meaning. I'm using Mike Steger's work here from the University of Colorado, the three facets of meaning, significance. I matter, my life matters. Coherence, my life makes sense to me. And purpose, I have a mission, a goal, an intention. And in moments of suffering, when death occurs, or illness, or the loss of a job, these meanings fall apart. They disintegrate for a period of time. Coherence often disappears first. My life no longer makes sense to me. And from that triggers this downward spiral where we don't feel like we matter as much anymore. And then we don't, aren't clear about our purpose, our intention, our mission. Meaning shifts and falls apart. And we are asked over and over again to reconstruct meaning. And in so doing, we build capacity. We build resilience. I was just reading on the airplane down, Sports Illustrated had a story about this is almost the year anniversary of a terrible accident in Canada where a tractor trailer ran into a bus carrying um, hockey players, young hockey players, on a team called the Humboldt Broncos. And in that bus, 16 passengers and players were killed. In that bus was a young player, a 21-year-old named Logan Boulay. And Logan Boulay, the captain, one of the captains of the team and a rising star in the hockey scene in Canada, Logan Boulay was an unusual young man because on the turning of his 21st birthday, he chose to sign an organ donor card which in Canada evidently is an un has been an unusual thing. And he signed that organ donor card because his trainer, who he had worked with for years, had signed that card himself a year prior and had died suddenly a few weeks later. And in honor of his trainer, he himself signed that card. And because he had signed the card, six of his organs were donated. Six lives were saved. And because of the horror of the accident, and because of Logan's popularity, the news spread virally throughout Canada. And in the almost 12 months since his passing, hundreds of thousands of Canadians have registered for organ donation, potentially saving six times that number. Does this eradicate the scorching burn of the loss for his parents and his girlfriend and his teammates and his sister? No. Does it soften the burning edges of that pain by knowing that me the meaning of Logan's life lives on 
Yes, may it give them a pathway forward to create a life that holds the meaning of their suffering and the meaning of Logan's generosity. Yes. So we must seek to create meaning. The research on connection has been robust, clear, and straightforward for decades. We do better when we are connected. Women with multiple sclerosis symptoms, the elderly widowed, Men who've experienced cardiac surgery, children with life-threatening diagnoses, those of us who've lost jobs, those of us who've experienced betrayal. We all do better when we are connected. And that means, first, that we must be connected here to ourselves, just as Tal was saying, to stand in that place of self-fullness, where generosity and compassion are brought to the self as well as to others. Connection begins here. And we know from the data that we don't need a posse, we don't even need a tribe, although it's fantastic to have a Wahasu tribe. One, we need one. And it can begin here. And yet I'd like to name a reality that many of us are experiencing, either for ourselves or for loved ones. Many of us are lonely, or lonelier than we would like to be. And the most resilient of us know in times of loneliness, to choose to seek the good by gathering stories of the best of us. This is some of the work of Margarita Tarragona, who you'll hear later today, I believe. To seek the stories that remind us of the good of humanity. Recently, I had an opportunity to see a Broadway show called Come From Away, which tells the story of what happened when 9-11 occurred here in this country. The minute that we realized what was happening, airspace over America was shut down, and planes that were either en route in America or somewhere else had to go somewhere. And 39 planes were diverted to a tiny town in Newfoundland called Gander. You see, in the 1940s and 1950s, our jets didn't have the long-haul fuel capacity to make it all the way over to the pond or to Asia, and they had to fuel somewhere. And so the ones heading that way well, I don't know where Miami is, but like that way, um, needed to stop. And so Gander is this tiny town, literally of 5,000 people, with a giant airport. And 39 huge planes were diverted to Gander, carrying 7,000 people, representing 95 countries, every culture, every religion on, that, on those planes, six or seven dogs, a couple of cats, and two rare bonobo monkeys. The townspeople of Gander, 5,000, less than the number of people who had been uh, billeted there, 5,000 people took them all in, fed, clothed them, calmed them down for five days and five nights. On the second day, the mayor of Gander took as many as he could to the hockey rink, which was the biggest place in town, and made them uh, honorary Newfoundlanders. In order to become one, you have to drink a horrible beer concoction called Skeech, you have to kiss a cod, and you have to sing a Newfie song. In the opening refrain to the Broadway play telling this story, we hear over and over again the following phrase, there is a candle in the window, and the candle is always lit. If you are lonely, seek the stories that will nourish you as you remember to stay connected to yourself here, and then look for connection elsewhere. And we must live into paradox. Resilience, health, optimism never rests in black and white thinking or black and white behavior or feeling. As Karen Rivich from Penn says, we must seek cognitive as well as emotional flexibility, which will drive fluidity and flexibility in our behavior, in our choices. We must hold into that gorgeous and, as Tal teaches the genius of the and, holding ourselves as imperfect and magnificent, as falling apart and growing, as broken and whole. So if you see yourself at any moment today or at any time in your life thinking a self-defeating thought or being cruel to yourself or you know, despising others or feeling doubt about yourself, allow yourself to think what you think and feel what you feel and build in that beautiful and. I'm worried I'm not going to be good enough and I have strengths. 
I'm so frustrated by how this person is behaving, and I have a choice in terms of how I respond. My heart has been shattered, and I can choose awe, wonder, generosity, hope. I've been working, I'd be, I'll be working in May at Harvard with some uh, medical school professors who are teaching physicians how to work with the dying and have been invited to come and speak to them about positive psychology and dying. And one of the heads of the program there, I love this, her philosophy when she's working with um, dying patients is to say to them, don't die on me yet until you're dying. In other words, there is a way to live even as you are dying that elevates resilience, that elevates meaning and generosity, and that elevates our strengths. And we work with them, we work with people in those last few weeks and months to share their stories because when you have nothing else to share, when you can't move and you can't feed yourself, you still have your story to share. You still have wisdom and knowledge to offer the world, even if the wisdom is don't do it the way I did it, right? There is much left to share, to live into the living and dying at the same time. Paradox is the root of health and resilience. So in the few moments I have left, I wanted to, I, 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 one of the ways I try to prepare for talks that make me nervous is to pretend that this might be the last chance I have to teach. As if in Miami there was some, I don't know, larynx stealing lizard somewhere that was just gonna, after I leave here, that will be it. I'll never be able to teach again. What would it be like? What else do, would I have to say? And so I thought I'd challenge myself to add to these research-based tools and perspectives some sort of um, wisdom from the territory of working with those who've been dying for over 25 years now. And here's what I would love to remind you. Remember impermanence. The bad may never fully pass, but it will shift, and the good will come again. Remember that you are singular and particular, and because of this, precious. That you are living just as you are living matters deeply to the world. For no one else could bring forward what you are here to bring forward. Know that time, we don't have enough time to waste, and yet at the exact same time, you have all the time in the world to live into the struggles that you are living into, to make wise choices as you navigate some of those difficult decisions that many of us are holding. Take the time to bring forward your deepest wisdom. Feed someone, hug someone, smile at someone, even if you are lonely. As Rumi said, be a lamp, a ladder, or a lifeboat. Generosity has nourishment and vitality within it. And should a rare bonobo monkey come your way, or an organ from a young hockey player, or a tree of green, be grateful. Gratitude is a grace and the light. It is the candle in the window of our souls and the windows of the world. In the haze of this morning, as the air flows saffron, let us continue to play the game of our lives for keeps. Thank you so much.